you'd like to follow along in the reading of God's Word this morning, if you would turn to Matthew chapter 2. I'd like to read for you verses 1 through 12. This um, actually is, um, I thought about this this morning, might have made a good um, uh, Christmas, as it were, sermon, because it does talk about things uh, surrounding the events of Christ's coming, uh, but we'll see how it's also applicable to us today and, and during the time as we think of the Reformation. Matthew chapter 2, I'd like to read verses 1 through 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard it, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he began to inquire of them where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." Then Herod secretly called the Magi and ascertained from them the time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child. And when you have found him, report to me that I too may come and worship him. And having heard the king, they went their way. And lo, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And they came into the house and saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their own country by another way. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, as you know, over this past month, we've been looking at the uh, subject of worship, and we began by considering who, uh, or, yeah, who it is we are to worship. Actually, we, cons- we began by considering how we're to worship. We are to worship in the way only as God commands us to worship Him. Remember, we are not to be free and innovative in the worship of God, except in those areas where the Lord has allowed us to be. Uh, we are to do what we can as skillfully as possible, We are to lift up the best praise we can and the best words that we can find to worship Him, which is uh, why we often like to sing the the older hymns because they are so much richer in theology. They give to us uh, better words to praise the Lord, as it were. But again, only what the Lord commands us to do. And certainly, of course, the Psalms do as well. We also considered, secondly, whom we are to worship. And we saw, of course, we are to worship the true God the God who created all things, the one who is triune. That sets him apart from all the other so-called gods of the world. And then over the last couple of weeks, we've been considering a few of the reasons why we ought to worship him. The first week we considered that, we saw that though we were slaves to sin, and though we had nothing to look forward to but a future in hell, because that is what we all deserve for our sins in Adam as well as our own sins, Yet the Lord set us free from that condemnation and he not only uh, took us out of the kingdom of darkness, but he actually adopted us into his family as his own children. And now the Lord loves us as a father loves his children and he takes care of us. The second week we saw that we ought to praise him because the Lord was willing to pay such a great price in order to redeem us uh, from the kingdom of darkness and to make us his children. He did not spare his own son, but gave him for us all that we might become his children. And that is an infinite price that deserves infinite praise. Now, unless we can really understand the value, the worth of these blessings, we're never really going to be able to offer to God the kind of praise we ought to. We're not going to be able to lift up the words that we've been singing with our hearts unless we understand the greatness of his love and how unworthy we were, how much we didn't deserve it. Unless we see again the glory of that infinite and eternal love uh, 
we won't be able to do it. So that's something we want to continue to focus on uh, this morning and actually throughout our lives. Focus on his love so that we may give him glory, that we may give him the credit for his work, that we may honor him, that we may praise him, that we may give him our love, that we may give him all of our thanksgiving. Now, this morning, we're going to consider one more reason why we ought to worship the Lord, and that's simply because when we were dead and when we were completely oblivious to our danger, uh, the Lord came to us, the Father, as it were, sent his Son to us, not in the first coming, of course, and, of course, not in the second coming, which hasn't taken place, but as he sends his Son to us in the gospel. The Lord did that in order to awaken us, in order to bring trouble to our souls about our condition so that ultimately we might be saved. Now, much of what we're going to look at this morning was adapted from a sermon by Horatius Bonner, the uh, individual we're looking at today is one of the great hymn writers of the church. It's from his sermon called Jesus, the Troubler of Jerusalem. And the reason why I've been adapting sermons, at least over the last couple of weeks, is so we might get a little better insight into these men and what their hearts were like, what was the burden of their ministry. And certainly we're going to see the burden of Horatius Bonner's ministry was the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this morning we're going to look at two things, and again, this will give us a reason further to give glory to God. <clears throat> the first one is that Christ's coming troubled Jerusalem. And then secondly, we want to understand why his coming troubled Jerusalem. And then, of course, finally, how that applies to us. Well, first of all, let's consider that Jerusalem was troubled by the announcement of Christ's coming. I think from our passage, it's clear that the Son of God came into the world really in, in quite a silent way, so quietly that his arrival uh, wasn't even known in Jerusalem when the wise men came from the east. Now, we know that when Jesus was born that the angels made an announcement to the shepherds, but you realize that that was a rather small audience compared to all of Israel. Just a few shepherds out in the field. He didn't announce his coming with a great storm, with thunder and lightning, with an earthquake, or with the blast of trumpets. Apparently, the shepherds who heard uh, the angels singing didn't really make it known to anyone else either, except those that were at the stable. Or if they did, perhaps no one listened to them, thought they were crazy, or uh, they were ridiculed by others. We don't really know. But the, the message of the shepherds didn't get around too far. His mother and his father, who were there, of course, at the birth of Christ, didn't make his coming known either. Now, they knew who he was. They knew because Gabriel had come and told them. Remember how uh, Joseph was told by Gabriel in a dream or by the Lord in a dream not to put away Mary, his wife, and how Gabriel visited Mary and told her who this child was that was to be born they also, of course, when they were in the, uh, the stable, the shepherds came and told them what had just happened. They heard that too, and that further confirmed to them who this child was. But instead of spreading that news all over the place, they apparently treasured these things up in their hearts. They rejoiced that God had, was fulfilling his promises to Israel, but yet on the other hand, they were waiting for God in his perfect timing to make the child known. And now we see two years later, sometimes we forget that the coming of the wise men or the magi from the east took place two years after his birth. And we know that because of the, uh, the age of the children that Herod sought to kill and the fact that the uh, star had been there for, uh, for two years. They asked, it, well, as we read in our text, they ascertained the time of his birth from the wise men. And it had been two years. Two years later, these wise men come seeking this king who had been born. Now, it's interesting that these men obviously didn't come from Bethlehem. They didn't come from Nazareth. They didn't come from Palestine. They were from outside of Israel. They were Gentiles, Gentiles from the land of Israel's enemies. They were Chaldeans. That is, they were the Assyrians. They came from those that had actually taken the northern kingdoms of, of uh, or the northern kingdom of Israel away into captivity and also from those that had taken the southern kingdom away eventually. They were the ones hated the most by Israel. They were from the east, also a place that was known for its knowledge, 
and for its science. And the interesting thing is that when these men came, and they really had no connection to the shepherds, they had no connection to Mary and to Joseph, they didn't come acting on some kind of hunch. They came because of something they had seen, something that the Lord had revealed to them. They came because they were eyewitnesses. They had seen his star risen in the east, and they had followed it knowing that it was going to lead them to Jerusalem's king. And somehow they knew that this king was going to bring them hope. Now here we see faith, faith that we didn't find in Israel, faith outside of Israel, Gentile faith fixed upon the star of Jacob that had risen. Now think about these wise men, they're actually coming to Jerusalem expecting that everybody already knows this, and yet they find Jerusalem is surprised by this knowledge because Jerusalem is in complete ignorance. The religious leaders didn't even know that he had come. The king of Jerusalem, who was Herod, didn't know either. Now that shouldn't surprise us. But still, as the king of Jerusalem, he should have known what was going on within, uh, within the, the confines of his rule. And he was completely unaware of it. And he didn't even know where this child was born until he asked the scribes. So what these Gentiles had to say was a complete surprise to everyone in Jerusalem, even though the birth had taken place two years earlier. Now, what was most surprising about this was the Jews' reaction to the news. They didn't rejoice in the fact that the Messiah had come, but instead they were troubled by this news. Now, this wouldn't be so surprising, I suppose, if, if the wise men had come to Babylon, or if they had gone to Rome, or had gone to Egypt, these apostate cities, but they came to Jerusalem, the city of God, among a people who were supposed to be uh, ready for the Messiah's coming and waiting for him, a city that should have rejoiced, but they didn't rejoice, they were troubled. So we see the wise men come and their message of the birth of the king troubles Herod and Jerusalem. Well, let's consider secondly why this happened why Jerusalem was troubled by this. I mean, after all, the message was not all that threatening. At least it doesn't seem to be on the surface. It was the announcement of the arrival of a child, the birth of a king. And from the time uh, that had elapsed since his birth, he was still just a baby, just a toddler. Now, things might have been different if, if they told them that we know the king has been born and our king is coming in order to dethrone you, Herod, and to place this child on the throne by force. Now, that might have troubled them, but that's not what they said. Or, of course, um, if their own king was coming to kill the babe, that could have been threatening as well. But that's not what they said. What they said was, a king has been born. We want to know where he is so that we might go and worship him. So why was that so troubling? Now we know why Herod might have been troubled by this, because he was a foreigner, because he was a tyrant, because he knew the people hated him, because they knew the birth of this child would probably mean his overthrow because they would want to take this king and put him on his throne. That would explain why Herod was troubled, but not why the rest of Jerusalem was. These men were bringing good news. They were bringing a good report. And even if their report had been found out to be false later, Jerusalem should still have been happy about the announcement of the birth of this king. It was the best of all possible news that they could have, they could have brought. I mean, think about it for a minute. This was the announcement of the one they had been expecting. This was their great national hope, the Messiah, the King of Israel, the son of David had come to redeem their nation. He had been born. Their response really should have been more like that of Simon. Remember when, oh, excuse me, not Simon, but Simeon. When Simeon saw the child, he said, now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. But yet in the light of this best possible news they could have received, Israel was troubled. Troubled. 
Now again, why were they troubled? Well, some undoubtedly were troubled by the way the news came to them. Even uh, it was through these Gentiles and, and not through their religious leaders. I mean, the leaders should have known what was going on. They should have known that Messiah was coming. Why is it coming through these Gentiles? What's going on with our leaders? Others may have been troubled because they didn't know what this might have meant for Israel. Many believe that Christ was coming to be a leader, to lead them against Rome and to break off, as it were, the yoke of their tyranny and to set them free. Perhaps his coming meant persecution. Perhaps his coming would mean war. But the main reason that they were troubled by this was that many of them just weren't ready to receive him. They were not ready for his coming. As the news spread through Jerusalem, they undoubtedly began asking themselves, in light of the fact that Messiah had come, am I ready to meet him? Am I ready for his coming? Now, every Jew had some idea of what Messiah would do when he actually came. And they had a variety of ideas. But there was one thing that they knew for certain about him, something that was very plain in the Old Testament, that he was a righteous man and that he was coming on a righteous mission against evil. And the question is, were they ready to meet him face to face? He was the holy messenger of the holy God. He was coming to speak holy words. He was coming to do holy things. And as much as they may have hated the rule of the Romans over them and the tyrant, Herod, who was their king, that would be better than a holy king if you were not ready to meet him. They were troubled because they weren't ready to receive him. They were not ready to be called to account. You know, our own experience teaches us, as well as the Bible, that our consciences are often better informed than our minds. They can respond more quickly to things that threaten us. There was a certain widow in Zarephath uh, whose son was, uh, uh, well, actually whose son was saved by uh, Elijah when he came, and the Lord provided for her and her son by miraculously causing the flour and the oil to continue to come until the famine was over and so forth. Actually, I might have mixed a couple of those. I think it was the flour and the water, okay? But after the famine was over and things seemed to sort of level out, on one day the child grabs his head and begins to cry out, my head, my head, and he collapses and he dies. Now when that takes place, the first thing that the widow says is this to Elijah. What do I have to do with you, O man of God? You have come to, to me to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. Now, why did she say that? Why, did, why was she saying those things to Elijah? Well, it was because she thought that the Lord was judging her for her sins. Her conscience responded much more quickly than her mind did. She was guilty of sin, and she thought that was the cause of her son's death. Now, when the Lord brings difficulty into our lives, when he brings difficulty into our family's lives, or into our nation's uh, experience, our conscience is usually the first thing to respond. It knows better because it knows of its guilt. When you tell an unbeliever the truth, it makes him uncomfortable. And the reason why it does is because it troubles his conscience, not necessarily his mind. He doesn't like the holy light of God's word shining into the recesses of his soul and exposing all of his sins. You see, that's the work of conscience, is to show us our sins so that we might repent. And when Christ comes and he shines his light, it troubles the conscience. And that is how the birth of the king of Israel affected Jerusalem. Now, we know that Christ came to bring peace with God, but in some, very, very, well, some other very important respects, we also know that Christ did not come to bring peace but he came to bring a sword. There's an interesting dichotomy, as it were. There are things about Christ's coming that everyone likes, that everyone would love, but there are aspects of it that, everyone, that, that most people don't like. Okay? We know that he came, for instance, to bring to us God's grace. Now, who's going to complain with that, you know, about that? But it is a holy grace, a grace that can make us uncomfortable unless we are prepared to surrender to the Lord 
in the way that he would have us to surrender, which is entirely. He came to offer us rest. He came to offer us forgiveness and eternal life. And yet, at the same time, to lay claim to our whole lives. This is something that most people won't accept. And as a matter of fact, no one will, apart from the Spirit's work. He came to offer us his life, as we know from the, uh, you know, as we're reminded by the Protestant Reformation and the things that took place around this time, how the gospel was rediscovered, the gospel of God's free grace. Well, the Lord Jesus came to offer us his life, eternal life, through free grace. But he also shows us that there is a cross that we need to bear and a yoke that we need to be willing to submit to. So he offers himself to us as savior from the consequences of our sins, but at the same time, he also demands to be a savior from our sin. In other words, not just from the guilt of sin, but also from its power. Now this is why the Lord Jesus Christ isn't always welcome where he comes. This is why he is often rejected. Men might welcome his love. They might love to hear about the love of God, sending his son into the world in order to save men, but they don't want to hear it at the cost of their own lives, and so they turn away. Now, one thing we should notice here is the fact that the wise men were not troubled by this, and that's a rebuke to Israel, isn't it? They began eagerly seeking after this king as soon as they saw his star in the east. They were willing to submit to him. They were willing to worship him. And because they had this willingness of heart, they were not afraid of meeting him either. They were not troubled by his coming. They were excited by it. They were rejoicing. You see, if you are willing to receive the Lord Jesus Christ and to submit to him on his terms, you have nothing to be afraid of. Now, at the same time, we need to realize that this troubling that Jesus brought is not a bad thing, but it's actually quite good. It's something that we need not only to come to Christ, but also after having come to Christ in order to be sanctified. If you have never actually been troubled by looking at the Lord Jesus Christ in his face, if you've never been troubled in your hearts by your sins, then you have something to be afraid of. Jesus comes to trouble sinners in order to awaken them. You know, wherever the Apostle Paul went preaching the gospel, of course, Peter as well, wherever the message of the gospel went, it always met with different kinds of reactions, but never without persecution. When Jesus came to Corinth and the Apostle Paul, as we know, the spirit of Christ preaching through him, he came in order to trouble them, and he actually he created a great deal of trouble. We did the same thing in Thessalonica. And of course, Philippi and Derby and Lystra, and very often that trouble was in the form of persecution against the messengers. Now, Jesus didn't come to threaten anyone. He simply came to trouble them, to trouble them for a good reason. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ also came to Germany in the 16th century, and he troubled the church through a man by the name of Martin Luther. He troubled Switzerland through Zwingli and through Calvin. He troubled Scotland through John Knox and, of course, England through Thomas Cranmer and others and, of course, the Puritans later. And when he came to Germany, when he came to all these different countries, those countries were troubled. Whenever the Lord Jesus comes to a town, whenever he comes to a city, a family or an individual or to one who is asleep, they are troubled. Now, this is why the world persecutes the church because Christ troubles the world. You know, if Jesus left the world alone, the world would leave him alone. But when the Lord speaks the truth, when he preaches his gospel, when he sends revivals especially, it troubles the world. Now, it's the truth that troubles the world. It's not the false gospels. People embrace false gospels. They love those. But the gospel of God's free grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone and a gospel that tells us that it's going to cost us everything we have in order to follow him, that is what troubles the world. It troubles everyone who hears it, but only some are converted by it, while others were not. The only hope that the world has is to be troubled by Jesus, to be awakened by him as he calls them to repentance through the proclamation of the gospel, 
If Jesus leaves the world alone, the world will perish. But the more fully the gospel is preached, and the more they are troubled, the more men will come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and of course, women and children. Just think about your own experience. Didn't the gospel trouble you once? The reason it did was because of your sin. If you're a Christian here this morning, you were troubled before the Lord brought relief through the gospel. Now finally, let's remember one last thing about this, and that is that when the Lord troubles, that he always does it in love. He is seeking to awaken those who are asleep. He comes in his grace as he came to Jerusalem. He's not trying to scare us away. He seeks to show us our need of him so that we might receive him. Now, the only reason why Christ coming to you would trouble you is if you have another king that you are serving because that king doesn't want competition. But if by God's grace, you're tired of serving those other kings, you're tired of serving the world, you're tired of serving your flesh, you're tired of serving the devil and you want to be free from those things, then Christ's coming and his troubling you will actually be an encouragement to you because he is willing to free you. So if Christ is troubling you this morning, submit to him, receive him, receive his grace as he offers it to you in the gospel. Let him change your heart so that you might submit to him and worship him with your life. But let's remember too that as believers, as Christians, Christ still comes to us and he still troubles us because none of us here are without sin. Whenever the, his holy light <clears throat> is shown in our faces, it will always trouble us. But remember that that is a good thing. The Lord does that so that he might turn you away from your sins, bring you to repentance, and that you might <clears throat> grow in grace. So yes, uh, Jesus is the troubler of Jerusalem. Yes, Jesus does bring trouble wherever he goes. But his trouble is good trouble. It's a necessary trouble. We need to be troubled by him so that we might learn to trust in him entirely for our salvation and for our sanctification. Well, let's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, let's bow in a few moments of prayer. And let's ask the Lord if he is willing to trouble our hearts in those areas where they need to be troubled so we would turn from our sins. If we haven't come to Christ at all, pray that God would give you no rest until you close with Christ, until you trust him. And if you are a believer here this morning, ask that he would point out your secret sins and cause you to be troubled by those things so that you would turn from them to him. Let's, let's spend a few moments in prayer.